Hello and welcome. I'm Ramesh Ramachandran and uh, you're watching a special broadcast here on DD India. I have with me a very special guest, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Brazil, Ernesto Araujo, to talk about Brazil-India ties in the light of President Jair Bolsonaro's visit to India and also about regional and global issues of interest or concern to both Brasilia and New Delhi. Mr. Minister, thank you so much for making time to be on DD India. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Welcome. If I can dive straight into the, uh, the India-Brazil ties, Mr. Minister, in the light of President Bolsonaro's visit, how would you describe contemporary Brazil-India ties, uh, say, in terms of trade and investments, people-to-people -people ties, and defense and security? I think uh, both of us are a key partner for each other. Sure. That's very clear now. We uh, have uh, similar goals, I think, of uh, reaffirming ourselves as two great nations who uh, want to uh, be uh, part of the, uh, the shaping of, uh, of the world in terms of uh, democracy, freedom, but also prosperity, security. Sure. So you mentioned uh, key areas in that partnership, prosperity, everything that has to do with trade and investment. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, maybe in both countries tend to look uh, at developed countries are, as our uh, main partners right. uh, for uh, that goal. We keep looking that way, but uh, we have to look much more uh, at each other, I think. Uh, security, everything that has to do with uh, uh, feeling ourselves in, uh, in uh, safe neighborhoods, uh, so to say, sure. uh, in our regions. This is a challenge for us uh, as well. Um, and uh, the whole agenda of uh, uh, coordinating uh, our positions uh, uh, across the world in international fora. So uh, whenever we look uh, uh, at the uh, interests and values that we want to, uh, to foster and defend, we see India uh, at our side. So uh, this is a very special partnership. Mr. Minister, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a perception uh, in India that when it comes to Latin America and Brazil in particular, mm -hmm. Uh, from India's perspective, South America may fall in India's blind spot in that sense that beside the geographical distance between India and Brazil, there also seems to be a psychological or a you know, mental gap, so to speak, in terms of knowing about each other, in terms of people-to-people -people ties, culture, society. How do you intend to bridge this gap and would the President's visit help bridge that gap going forward? Yes, uh, we uh, have to raise uh, much more awareness, I think, Indeed. about each other, about uh, culture in, in the broad sense. For example, we are signing agreements and a memorandum of understanding on uh, traditional uh, medicine. Uh, so we want to have more of Indian uh, traditional uh, Ayurveda medicine, for example, and yoga. Uh, this just to give a sense of sure. uh, uh, how uh, things can uh, can merge in, in our relations. But uh, also, as the President had previously announced, we are working towards uh, facilitating a visa-free entry for uh, Indians uh, in Brazil. This would, of course, uh, be a big boost for, for tourism and for people-to-people -people exchanges. Um, those are uh, examples of what uh, we can do, but I think uh, the visit itself uh, will already raise awareness uh, among people in Brazil regarding it. Of course, we uh, know India is a big country, uh, the economy is growing, but uh, after people see the present here, right. and I'm pretty sure after tomorrow with the uh, Independence Day celebrations, and this very special uh, honor that uh, the Indian government is, uh, is making us and President Bolsonaro, uh, this will, uh, I think, bring this awareness to a new level. Would you say that language might be a handicap and could uh, education or you know student exchanges help uh, to foster that uh, you know, feeling of camaraderie and friendship between the two peoples yes oh yes oh yes that's for sure um, we uh, that's a handicap that we have uh, in terms of uh, presence in the world but people today in Brazil are uh, I think becoming much more uh, conscious that uh, we are are not an island that we uh, have to engage in, uh, in the world in a different way that we can not only receive but we can bring our ideas uh, and our identity so to say to the world. I think that's similar to India. One aspect that we are working with is we are creating a new uh, institute for the promotion of Brazilian culture abroad mm -hmm. and for the teaching of uh, Brazilian uh, Portuguese. So uh, I hope that in, in the near future this will be fully in place and that would 
can have this uh, presence in India. Of course, uh, it's hard with it's such a huge country, such a huge population, but we think we can make a difference and that uh, this would uh, allow people to to go more into the, the grain of uh, each other's culture. Of course, we have some general ideas, but uh, it's so fantastic to, uh, to be here and to, and to feel this uh, warmth toward Brazil. And I think this would uh, create the, uh, the atmosphere for uh, also for people to be more interested for Brazilian culture here, uh, all the complexity of our uh, uh, literature, uh, uh, I don't know, painting, uh, dance, everything. And, and the same in Brazil. You, you mentioned that Brazilians these days are increasingly becoming more aware of the world around them and that they are not an island unto themselves. So in that context, Mr. Minister, when, when Brazilians, an average Brazilian, thinks about India, what do they relate to? I mean, if you ask an Indian today, he, he or she might say, talk about football, uh, Brazilian footballers of uh, past and present. They might talk about uh, samba. They might talk about the Rio Carnival. But what about the average Brazilian? When they think about India, what comes to their mind? Uh, I would say the first uh, size, size of uh, mm -hmm. population. These people, uh, of these people, are very conscious. But I think they're still uh, a little bit uh, way back in terms of uh, feeling the economic dynamism of sure. India. I think people still perceive India as uh, more, uh, let's say, uh, lukewarm, growing country mm -hmm. than it really is, and that mm -hmm. it's clearly uh, become. Um, they, uh, I think they also uh, would, would see the, uh, of course, the uh, enormous depth, uh, historical depth of Indian culture and, and civilization, sure. uh, but without much, much detail, right? Mm -hmm. uh, many people wouldn't know about all the uh, richness of, uh, 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 historical richness and cultural richness of, uh, of India. Uh, so uh, we would, people would think about uh, maybe the, the temples or, or the dance, but uh, uh, I think they, they uh, need to uh, to know more. I need to know more about about India. I um, uh, way back. I, I always uh, was a fan of uh, uh, history of religions and, and different religions. I read a little bit about about Hinduism, for example, and it's enormous and all the uh, the Vedic uh, tradition. So uh, that's something that uh, I think we'll uh, pay more attention to, and it, sure. it's uh, incredibly. Uh, uh, rich and, and rewarding to study. And Mr. Minister, have you had a chance to visit India before? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I was here around 2006 for the uh, negotiations of what became the, uh, the preferential Mercosur-India uh, agreement with uh, a few preferences that, by the way, we want to expand now. It's one of the goals that we have in our action plan to expand a lot that agreement. But yes, uh, I was here twice for, uh, for those negotiations back, back then. And how might have India changed between then and now? I mean, what's been your experience like? Yes, you know, um, of course, today is a very special moment. Sure. We're here, uh, so it's uh, hard to, to compare. But the feeling I have is that uh, today people, uh, they seem more uh, prosperous. The c country seems uh, more uh, dynamic. Uh, you see more uh, growth. I don't know if uh, it's, it's very uh, short uh, to, to say that, but I think people are happier and, and more confident sure. today here in, uh, in India. Maybe I think that's the same in Brazil too. Absolutely. Mr. Minister, talking about dynamism, we have two dynamic leaders in Brazil and India today, in President Bolsonaro and Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Now the two leaders seem to share a similar worldview. They are both uh, pro-market and they have their own ideas of where they want to see their respective countries in the years ahead. So talking about these two leaders, in your estimation, you've seen them work at close quarters. The two leaders have met twice already at the G20 summit yes. in Japan last year and the BRICS summit in Brasilia last year. How do, would you explain their uh, chemistry or working relationship, Mr. Minister? Yes, I think they, um, they share, um, a, they're very practical and uh, result-oriented, and at the same time, they have a vision for their respective mm -hmm. countries. Uh, and I think this reflects uh, the fact that they, they both perceive uh, a, a nation as something that is, a, that is a whole, that you can't separate, let's say, economic growth uh, from the rest of the, uh, of the society, from uh, our identity, from our tradition. So I think both of them uh, are proving with the uh, good economic performance. Of course, India is already ahead in, in that process, but Brazil is beginning to grow very fast. They're proving that you can have a... Uh, open, uh, dynamic, uh, efficient economy 
uh, functioning in a society that is a, a true uh, nation that where people feel that they belong together, that they're just not together by chance, that they have their, their traditions, their roots together. So uh, I think they're, they're converge in that, uh, in that uh, vision and also, in, in, as I said, in their determination to, to do things. Sure. You know? Mr. Minister, India and Brazil signed the Strategic Partnership Agreement in 2006. Uh, and what's the way forward in pushing that relationship forward in the sense of an action plan to implement those steps uh, in the years to come? Exactly. Well, uh, I think the main thing is uh, a follow-up process. Right. Uh, I was uh, already talking with uh, Minister Jai Shankar, and we are, are planning uh, a meeting uh, uh, in the uh, maybe next two or three months, mm -hmm. uh, tops. Uh, maybe before that, but uh, certainly very, uh, very shortly. Uh, to, to start the follow-up process. Of course, this involves so many agencies in, in both countries, but we are in charge of coordinating and, and pu uh, pushing this forward. So um, lots of uh, homework, I think, for both countries. But um, we'll, we'll, I think the, the secret is, is follow-up and uh, keep regular uh, contacts. Of course, uh, we hope that uh, President and Prime Minister keep having the opportunity to, to meet also on the side of G20 and uh, other uh, venues. This always uh, helps to uh, to uh, to build and to maintain that momentum. But uh, uh, and also, I think the secret is to keep the two things together: the vision and the practical side. Uh, and this we very much uh, have uh, from the talks I also had with uh, Minister Jai Shankar. We also uh, saw that we uh, converge a lot in uh, in our uh, worldview, which is basically uh, that of our, our leaders, of course. But um, we are uh, very enthusiastic about, that, about this, very determined to work together. So Minister, besides uh, tr trade investment and energy and agriculture, there's a fourth pillar of the relationship, that's defense and security. Uh, what have the two sides decided on this count? And also related is shown terrorism. Now terrorism, uh, no country is immune from terrorism these days. So, and India views itself as a victim of terrorism emanating from its neighborhood. So what's Brazil's position on the issue of terrorism facing countries around the world as we speak? Sure. Uh, that's a very important area for, uh, for cooperation. We signed, for example, a memorandum on uh, cyber security, which is a whole area of security that we have to pay, of course, much more attention to. Um, uh, the uh, uh, te uh, juridical uh, le legal as uh, assistance uh, in terms of uh, fighting organized crime, for example, and other, uh, and other activities. We, need much more of, of that in terms of coordination, exchange of, of information. This is um, in the pipeline and already signing some important agreements in that direction. Uh, and this comes from the realization that, uh, as you said, uh, we uh, face uh, to a large extent common threats in uh, fighting organized crime and fighting terrorism. Uh, this is uh, maybe not a new reality, but uh, there's a new awareness in Brazil about uh, the presence uh, of, uh, of terrorism uh, near us. Right? Uh, people wouldn't talk a lot about that, but now we, uh, we see that it can be a threat uh, in Latin America. We uh, just uh, last week, uh, we uh, had a, a meeting of all the countries of the Americas mm -hmm. uh, in the, the, for the uh, fight against terrorism. That's the, already the third that we, uh, that we um, convene to uh, exchange uh, intelligence and other uh, resources to, uh, to uh, fight terrorism. Uh, this uh, is very interesting because uh, many people in Brazil would deny that uh, there's any uh, uh, threat like that, mm -hmm. uh, would deny that uh, uh, organized crime can have any, uh, sure. like, like drug trafficking for example, can have any links with terrorism and mm -hmm. uh, Okay, we can see it that way, but the world doesn't work that way. It's, it's very clear now. So, um, uh, so w recently we had uh, issued statements, and President has talked a lot about how important it is to uh, sure. to fight terrorism with our partners uh, across the globe, um, and it's in our constitution. The Brazilian constitution has a set of uh, uh, goals that our foreign policy has to uh, obey, uh, and uh, one of them is uh, the total repudiation. Uh, of terrorism. And uh, I used to say, that, okay, repudiate is not only saying I don't like terrorism, mm -hmm. but doing something about it and, uh, and doing something, uh, as I said, in convergence and in cooperation with 
countries that have uh, the similar values to, to ours. So uh, for the uh, future and survival of democracy of freedom in our region, like I think in any region, we have to open our eyes and fight together that, that scorch. Let's talk a bit about regional issues and issues of particular concern and interest to Brazil. Let's start with uh, climate change. Now, that's a clear and present danger to many countries around the world. But what would be your view uh, specifically about climate change? What's your take on this issue? Yes. Um, well, climate change is a concern for so many people, so many countries nowadays. Brazil is uh, very active in the, uh, in the discussions. Uh, we are uh, a member of the, the Paris Agreement, and we uh, want to keep uh, all our commitments that we made, our national commitments and contribution to the, uh, to the Paris uh, Agreement. Uh, in our case, this has to do basically with uh, curbing uh, deforestation. That's uh, basically how we can best uh, reduce uh, emissions in Brazil. And also uh, uh, through uh, biofuels and uh, renewable energies, Brazil is one of the leaders in renewable energies. Um, we uh, also think that, uh, and I think very strongly that that discussion has to be a, a rational discussion. Uh, I'm afraid that uh, many times this is uh, going uh, off road and uh, becoming some sort of, uh, uh, I know, collective uh, paranoia or, or hysteria. And this has to be addressed uh, scientifically. Mm -hmm. Many people talk about uh, the science of climate change. Uh, and, but sometimes don't want to uh, hear uh, scientists that uh, have, uh, let's say, different views about uh, what's going on with the, uh, the climate and the causes for, for climate change. So um, it's not, I, I hate the word denier, it's not being denier, in not fact, denier. Mr. Minister, yeah. if I can yeah. quote what you said uh, yeah. in your visit to the U.S. last year, yes. and this is what you said, there is no climate change catastrophe. From the debate that's going on, it would seem that the world is ending. The big threat facing Brazil and other countries is not climate change, but rather ideology. And you go on to say that uh, lack of scientific proof over the causes of global warming exist. So uh, is that still your position, Mr. Minister? Yeah, the, there must be a, a rational democratic debate about that. I fear that many times uh, people, including scientists, who um, entertain doubts about uh, let's say, the, the rhythm uh, of climate change and uh, the origin of uh, climate uh, change, uh, especially the change in temperature, of course. Those people are demonized. So I, I don't think that's scientific. I mean, th th this debate should be uh, allowed in a, a much more free way, I think, much more open way. Um, also, um, you know, I stand by that, uh, that uh, opinion, that uh, you, it's very hard to talk about catastrophe or, or climate crisis today. That comes from Do you reading... you think these fears yeah. are exaggerated? Yes, I think so. I think so. I think the, uh, from reading the uh, reports from uh, IPCC, uh, you don't see the same uh, uh, impression uh, that there is a, a climate crisis as you see sometimes among uh, politicians and in the media. And it's, uh, I think, very ob obvious that sometimes this issue uh, can be used for political and uh, economic uh, purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, so if... Uh, you have uh, certain policy goals uh, and uh, they are hard to achieve, but then you say, no, there is a crisis and the world will end tomorrow if you don't uh, so follow my... In other words, Mr. Minister, would you, would you say that it is a hoax? No, I, I wouldn't say a hoax, but uh, I think uh, it can be used. And don't, don't say that it's always used. I think mostly it's uh, well-intentioned people that... Uh, have that sort of uh, discussion. But uh, it can be used to promote uh, agendas that you wouldn't be able to promote uh, otherwise. Uh, so uh, if you use that sort of uh, climate scare uh, to uh, control the world economy in a different way that it would work otherwise, then you start to see that uh, there's something that can be something to it in terms of uh, uh, political use of that, uh, of that issue. Uh, so, personally, what I advocate for is, uh, uh, is scientific uh, debate, uh, open debate. I think societies shouldn't live, in, in our day, shouldn't live in a situation where we, we talk, we talk about uh, imprisoning people who uh, have uh, entertained doubts about uh, the science of climate change, for example. Sure. Uh, so, that's, that's basically it. Sure. So there's a related subject. That's the, uh, the Amazon rainforest fire issue. Yes. Uh, 
what might be some of the lessons that the government of Brazil may have learned uh, from this uh, this issue? And there's uh, a lot of uh, you know criticism of the way the government may have handled this issue. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, there's a commentary in the Brazilian media, for instance, which accuses the government of uh, trying to uh, go in for more development as opposed to protecting the environment, of going in for hydro dams in the Amazon rainforest in terms of prioritizing development over the environment and also opening up the protected or the reserved land for development purposes. So would you agree with those uh, allegations or accusations? No, I don't. First of all, uh, if you look at the, uh, the figures and so important uh, in, in this debate, as well, uh, as much as in climate change, to look at the, the figures in a cold and rational way. Uh, uh, this last year, 2019, uh, the, uh, we, uh, the, the number of uh, fire occurrences was below the average for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, from reading the press, you wouldn't have that, that impression, I would say. So, uh, uh, so that's, that's the first thing. Why so much noise now? Uh, for political reasons, because uh, 15 years ago, different governments in place in Brazil, which was maybe more liked by the uh, international media, and, uh, no one talked about that. Now, uh, maybe they don't like our stance in, in so many areas, so they use this to... Uh, as a political tool to... Oh yes, it was, it was used as a political tool, both domestically and internationally, I think. Sure. Uh, but we recognized, of course, we don't want the fires to be there. So, second thing, uh, for the first time, we organized a, um, a huge action to, uh, to combat the fire. So, the, the uh, figures for August were high, I mean, on average, but high. Then, after we started that action, September was one of the lowest uh, September uh, uh, occurrences in, in September for. Uh, for a long time. So, uh, and, and now we just uh, created a council for the Amazon, which will be coordinated by the vice president, uh, to uh, uh, organize the different agencies that have to do with, uh, with the Amazon. So, also, that's a first. Okay. So, uh, that, that shows that our commitment is stronger than, than previously. Uh, no piece of legislation was changed uh, on the environment in Brazil. Uh, if by this administration, and we don't intend to in, in, any, in any case. Um, nothing that can be uh, considered an incentive sure. for, for deforestation, sure. nothing that can, can be considered either uh, uh, legislation or action that, that can uh, be uh, seen uh, that way. That's a total wrong interpretation uh, of what we uh, think of and what we are doing. Um, what uh, is a strong point that we make is you need two things. You need uh, protection, let's say classical protection, trying to you know. Uh, uh, and we have the legislation in place, so we have to enforce it. Mm -hmm. right? uh, uh, but you also need to create alternatives for people who might be attracted to illegal activity in the Amazon. For example, uh, illegal logging or illegal mining. Uh, it's not enough to uh, just wall off areas. It's very difficult because it's such a huge region. You, uh, in, in, you have 20 million people uh, who live in the Brazilian Amazon. Yeah. Those people need to make a living uh, out of something. Uh, if they don't have good jobs, if they don't have uh, ways of livelihood, uh, what will we do? They have this uh, tendency to go towards uh, illegal uh, activities. So what we're working is towards sustainable development in the Amazon. Uh, one uh, among many, many uh, things we're doing is to uh, create a, a fund with the uh, Inter-American Development Bank to try to uh, channel international investment to uh, sustainable projects in the Amazon. Uh, I think we uh, had spent, have spent too much uh, money uh, just on the, let's say, the classical protection, which is good, and not enough money in creating uh, sustainable projects in mm -hmm. things like uh, ecotourism, things like uh, projects around the biodiversity uh, in, in the area. Uh, some people say, well, we should invest in uh, transforming the Amazon in some sort of uh, green Silicon Valley, so creating, you know, uh, real opportunities for, for people. Uh, of course, this, this will take time. So, uh, so we're working on, on sure. let's say, both fronts, sure. and that's, uh, that's very clear. Mr. One last uh, question, uh, and this has to do with your blog. <laughs> I'm told that uh, you maintain a blog which is called Meta Politics 17 yes. Against Globalism. So I'm just curious to know yes. how it came about, when and why. Because if I can quote one excerpt from the blog, you say that 
globalism is the economic globalization that's been driven by cultural Marxism and that is essentially anti-human and anti-Christian. If you could just uh, you know, give a sense to our viewers as to why this blog came about and when and why. Yes, well um, I started it uh, back in 2018 uh, during the um, election campaign in, in Brazil which was a, a moment where uh, because of the uh, the new message and the new uh, project that uh, President Bolsonaro, then a candidate, brought, people started to uh, you know uh, think uh, and see things in a in a different way. At least some people. Uh, we realized that the um, we had a system in Brazil and that maybe reflected the system worldwide where ideas were not discussed anymore, and you had a, let's say a uh, just a closed set of cliches that you have to follow and, and repeat. Uh, and this is part of what uh, we uh, I, I call globalism. I, uh, well, we could go on and on, but basically, um, uh, my my point is that uh, uh, after the uh, the fall of the uh, the Soviet Union and the uh, let's say the explicit uh, socialist bloc, you had a survival uh, mm -hmm. uh, of uh, some of their ideas through in different guys, uh, and uh, part of that lines of thought. Uh, Got hold of the uh, uh, of the process of uh, of globalization in order to uh, to foster their ideas, their their values, and um, I think those things must be uh, must be discussed. And in Brazil, uh, there was uh, I mean this is, my blog was a very very small part of a, a whole process I think of uh, rebirth of. Uh, uh, let's say intellectual interest and intellectual mm -hmm. activity in the country. People uh, used to talk only about the economy, and the debate should, uh, used to be only about, uh, okay, le having more privatization or less privatization. Okay, that's okay. In other but, words, your argument yeah. is that there are limits to liberalism. Is that what uh, your argument is? No, it's more it's more something that uh, I talked about before when I talked about the uh, commonality of vision between uh, Prime Minister Modi and uh, President Bolsonaro. Is that um, you should. Uh, you don't have to conceive of a liberal economy as something that is uh, that fun can function in the void, in a, some, some sort of social void, mm -hmm. when you have individuals that don't relate to each other and are just thrown together in a country. You know, uh, no, that uh, a liberal economy can uh, function uh, with let's call it a conservative society. Okay, just for lack of a mm -hmm. better terms. Um, that you can have an open economy in a society that uh, is a society that uh, functions uh, from its uh, its own uh, identity, as I said, where uh, where people have a sense of, of belonging together, of being a part of a of a nation. I would say that countries should be nations and not uh, and not customs territories, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and for a long time, uh, uh, we had this sort of denationalization process. Uh, as part of globalization, not uh, not against globalization, but globalization, I think, lost its soul in a way, uh, uh, and was leading countries to lose their souls, uh, and that's something that we, uh, I personally, I think, we should should be against because it's totally uh, uh, not only feasible, but I think the only way of, of having uh, efficient economies in the long run is uh, to have, uh, uh, let's say, uh, societies that are. Uh, where people trust each other and people like to, to live together and uh, not only a, a mass of uh, scattered individuals. So that's at least part of what, uh, uh, what we try to, to develop there in, in that blog. On that one, Mr. Minister, thank you so much for making time to speak to us at DD India. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your time.